Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Coin Geek Weekly Live Stream, or whatever this show is called. I, I think I screw it up every time <laughs> that I do the intro now. Uh, so sorry and thank you for tuning in. I'm your host, Kurt Wooker Jr. Uh, as professional as I can be, which is uh, just professional enough for Bitcoin, frankly, uh, and no more, no less, no more. Uh, but I do what I can. So. Everybody, uh, remind your friends, first of all, if you're not doing anything else right now, share this across social media. So if you send the link to the live stream, more people can see the video and ask questions and, and everything else. So Twitter, Twitch, uh, I don't know if there's a good way to share it to places like Relica or Powping, but uh, Facebook, etc. Let your friends know that, hey, there's a guy on, on social media who will answer Bitcoin questions live and uh, not treat you like you're a fool for asking silly questions. Because to quote Willy Wonka, there are no stupid questions, only stupid people. Uh, <clears throat> Rick Howard, I'll, I'll start real quick. Rumor I'm starting. Put your phones away. No codes this week. Right, guys? Right? <laughs> so uh, we should always thank our sponsors, uh, the lovely and delightful. I, I don't know if he's lovely because I haven't seen him, but uh, we have Four opportunities to win uh, some Bitcoin SV that'll be given away uh, via uh, I am Zatoshi and FreeBSV.com, our very, very loyal and wonderful sponsors of the live stream or sponsor. Uh, but please get your uh, your Relay X or your Simply Cash wallets ready. Get them ready to sweep. Uh, this works really well if you have a computer and your phone because they will pop up on the I believe it's the left side of the screen uh, when. When you see them, uh, whoever gets them first gets them. I get a lot of people who are like, hey, that one was invalid. It means you lost the opportunity to sweep the wallet first. So I apologize, but you just got to be a little bit faster. BSV Dragon saying, what do you think about MasterCard? Saying they also have many blockchain patents and Jack supporting COPA. I'm going to get to that in a second, but leave the question up because what I really want is for ads and sponsorship to just cut out everything except the very center of my face. So if you feel like sponsoring the, uh, the live cast, the live stream, or whatever the hell the show is called, please reach out to Alex Moon. He's Alex underscore Moon 89 on Twitter. Uh, you can talk to him about what it would be like to sponsor a live stream, put a tattoo on my face. We have special packages for such things. Uh, you can also talk to him about why you should be a guest or make your announcements soon, TM, on uh, on the live stream yourself. And before we get to questions and stuff, I want to let everybody know that my good friend, David Case, uh, one of the people that has been uh, one of the biggest supporters of the Chicago BSV meetup. Uh, he's also been a, a personal friend. He's helped answer some fundamental technical questions for me. He's also kind of my go-to guy for uh, why BSV instead of Ethereum? Uh, but he's the he's the creator of Crypto Fights. He's going to be on in a few minutes uh, to give us an update on the platform, but also answer questions that you have about Crypto Fights or Bitcoin in general, or even Ethereum in general, or you know why this rather than that. Uh, and he's going to explain a little bit of uh, some of the best ways to earn real life NFTs using the Crypto Fights game, which is. As always, coming soon. I know, I know. Here comes the chatter from the troll box. Why is everything coming soon? Well, it's because David works about 100,000 hours a week trying to solve problems in software. So you don't <laughs> have all kinds of customer service things to bog him down with when the thing goes live. But it does look beautiful. And I'm going to answer a couple of questions here before we cut to commercial and David uh, coming soon. Uh, so concerning MasterCard, this is... I've brought this on myself. I realize this because I talk about MasterCard all the time on social media. Well, MasterCard, uh, as many know and many also do not know, uh, they they helped build Digital Currency Group. And Digital Currency Group owns equity in basically every brand in the entire crypto space. So if it's a brand that you recognize and that you use regularly, it is likely owned by Digital Currency Group, or at least in part. And Digital Currency Group is just a proxy for MasterCard uh, and some insurance companies and, and some other big financial players, but MasterCard is the largest player there. Uh, naturally, they are also funding alongside uh, another dear friend of theirs, uh, Visa, to put together uh, the COPA, which is the, what do they call it? Crypto Open Patent Alliance, I think is what that stands for. Uh, they are colluding together with all of your favorite small blockers to uh, put some kind of a fund together to defend themselves against the most terrible or ter terrifying person in the history of Bitcoin, Satoshi Nakamoto, who frankly uh, designed a tool called Bitcoin that should have put them out of business about seven or eight years ago at this point. Uh, however, they were successful at tricking everybody into stacking 
Fiat. So I'm not really worried about it. Uh, <laughs> the their their goal has always been what their goal has always been. But they have a product, uh, Visa and Mastercard, that is that was designed in the 70s and 80s, and it's not nearly as powerful as the real Bitcoin. However, BSV needs you to get out there and do actual work. Uh, if you were to onboard big businesses to use transactions to increase their transaction efficiency or increase their data integrity, well, then it would be much harder for people to uh, to fight against and say that it's a scam or, or whatever else. But uh, business solves these problems. That's the that's the real thing to remember is that we can um, we can fight the war rhetorically. And frankly, that's that's what I'm here to do. I am a media personality. But what you can do is go fight the war uh, where it really counts, which is in business. Uh, you start making people's lives better, faster, cheaper, easier, and more profitable using the power of Bitcoin SV. And uh, all of a sudden, you become the center of the network and people like Copa and Blockstream and OKCoin and Lightning Labs and, and Pompliano and our dear friend Peter McCormick uh, can go back to doing what they really love doing, which is, I think, playing air DJ and air guitar at festivals. So that would be fun for everybody. Alex, uh, you deserve a thank you. I don't think I thanked you by name. Alex Moon, my delightful, lovely, and talented producer who at some point in the future, I may just click on so you can see him sitting on his couch producing the show uh, in a in a t-shirt. So he has covered up the camera just like he does every time I threaten him with, uh, with fame and stardom. So Alex, if you don't have any other questions before we lead into the advertisement, we could cut to buybsv.com ad and then come back with the... Let's see, what would be a good adjective for David Case? The enigmatic, the, <laughs> I don't know, the, the man with magic fingers at the keyboard uh, on crypto fights, uh, David Case. So let's cut to the ad and we'll be right back. This is buybsv.com, the quick and simple way to buy Bitcoin SV. You can't miss it. It says a quick and simple way to buy BSV on buybsv.com. It's safe and secure. Within an hour, you'll own BSV Digital Assets, which means it's so quick and simple. So if you want to buy BSV, use buybsv.com. It does exactly what it says. Hey, David. How you hey, doing, my friend? Kurt. I am doing well. How about yourself? Uh, good. It's really good to, to see you. Um, a lot of people don't know, but we... I've actually hung out a number of times in real life. You're a, a semi-regular attender of the Bitcoin SV Chicago meetup uh, and wearing the Hash War anniversary shirt, I see. So. That's right. <laughs> so if anybody wants to come meet uh, me and or David uh, as soon as uh, we're allowed to do such things again, uh, it'd be, be good to meet you. Meet, meet anybody out there at the at the BSV Chicago meetup. Uh, that's got to be going back two, two years now. When did we first meet, David? Yeah, I think it's got to be about... Probably a little, a couple months short of two years. Okay. And that's, uh, it's fascinating. I, I tell this story uh, often to people that like, yes, I know people who have left Ethereum because Ethereum didn't have the horsepower to to make their apps work or, or make whatever their vision is uh, go forward. And you're obviously one of the people that gets mentioned. So can you give us a just a brief history for anybody who doesn't know? Uh, what's the maybe 60 second history of crypto fights and How'd you start with Ethereum and how did you migrate uh, just even mentally to, to Bitcoin SV? Yeah, so it started with uh, Adam, my business partner uh, and CEO, just kind of putting a post on an Ethereum dev group on Reddit saying, hey, I'm looking for an Ethereum developer. And I reached out and I don't know that I'd call myself yet at that point a uh, super advanced developer, but I've been a software developer for almost 20 years and and had really gotten the crypto bug. So I'd been digging into Ethereum smart contracts, understanding that. And so when we started out, I mean, the game was very, very, the idea of the game was very simple of essentially like, okay, you have a, a fighter token that you build and you set some, you set some like parameters of how you want to configure this thing. And you just kind of like put it into the contract and someone else puts it into a contract and you get matched and, and an output spits out of here's what happened. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we started building on that. And then as we started digging into more and more um, kind of building out the game, game concepts more, it certainly got more and more complex. Um, and 
Um, and it wasn't going to, wasn't really going to work that well to just say they're just, there ended up being so much calculation within one Ethereum transaction that mm. it went over the gas limit. And basically we'd be taking up the entire, the entire block would be ours, which means we have to pay gas to get everyone else out of the way. Mm. Um, but then once we got more into like breaking this thing up into smaller transactions and having the game be more interactive, where instead of just like having a fighter and putting, going against someone else's fighter it ends up being more interactive. You're actually taking turns and choosing how to interact mm -hmm. with each other. And that started as a way to just break up those transactions a little bit. But you quickly reach the point with Ethereum where it really doesn't matter what you're trying to do. Um, I mean, there's some huge technical hurdles in that, like, I don't remember if it's eight or 11, but like you only have a few variables that you're even allowed to use. And as soon as you try to reference mm -hmm. more variables than that, well, it, it isn't an invalid, it's an invalid Ethereum code so there's there's all sorts of just really low level things like that mm. but then as trying as soon as you try and like every time you do anything that has even a single byte of data that takes a certain amount of gas and it it just it gets to the point where if you're wanting to do anything of any complexity at all you just you can't afford to do it and so then mm. we hit that those that ceiling fairly quickly and started looking into a lot of what was what was out there as kind of second layer chain solutions and yep. swapping tokens off of Ethereum onto a side chain and back onto it. And then you get into all sorts of things about, okay, but then it's really just a proof of authority side chain that everyone's yeah. just trusting me. So what's the point of even having a blockchain in the first place? It might as well just be a server and I'm telling it, Hey, yep. this is what happened. And, um, so we, we went down that path for about a year. And in that time we started we did a pre-sale of some weapons and, and armors for the game on, on yep. the Ethereum side of things. And those were on engine token, which is currently, I mean, I think when I, when we first were using that it was worth like seven cents. And last week I looked, it's like $2 and 60 cents. So <laughs> from the, uh, from the mooning aspect of things, there's definitely some, <laughs> some benefits with, with that. But, um, sure. when it comes to actually trying to move things, it's, it's just impossible. Um, so, so we, uh, yeah, during the hash war then of, this was not a one minute uh, <laughs> answer. By hey, no, no, yeah, I, th this is great, honestly. So, I mean, keep, keep going. This is fascinating. So then during the BSV BCH hash war, I don't remember what exactly happened during that, but something caused me to really look into Bitcoin at a much lower level when, where, mm -hmm. okay, this isn't just, I'm transferring money from one account, one address to another, but getting into understanding it might have actually been the push to within the BSV community to start pushing large large transactions through and storing data. Um, so, like, they came up with this concept of this B protocol, which is just a way of storing files on the blockchain. Mm -hmm. And that sure. might have been what really triggered it to get me to realize that oh, this is this is something where by by having by storing not just the fact that I'm I'm giving you this many satoshis, but I can tie on to that. A, a blob of data that describes what that really means is I had this thing that this, that this output, this Bitcoin output represented, and I can then in that blob of data explain how I want to change that, the state of that thing that's represented by that output sure. into a new state. And then you can actually record all the rules for how to interpret those cha state changes on the blockchain mm -hmm. as well. Um, that you get this really interesting state machine where you can kind of start with something that is just a, it's just a Bitcoin output and it mm. can start kind of growing and changing into being a fighter or a sword or a whatever else based on the yeah. fact that everyone who's interpreting the blockchain is interpreting the same set of rules that define what that mm. thing is. And those are the same set of rules because those are, you point to an actual Genesis on the blockchain that says, okay, that place right here is what defines a fighter. And so if you pull the code that's stored on the blockchain at that place, everyone's going to get the same code. Everyone's going to follow the same series of transactions on the blockchain. And so everyone's going right. to come to the same conclusion of what the actual state of this thing is. And so in some ways you can use all the benefits of, of Bitcoin for it to handle kind of authentication of, can you actually spend this UTXO? Is it yours? Um, but then also, pull together this this next layer interpretation of, okay, that's what the blockchain says. What does that mean? And you can replay through everything and figure out what that means. Interesting. 
and and then you so, get to an interesting point where things point to other things, which point to other things, and like everything <laughs> that's ever happened is all graphed yeah. together. Sure. No, it's fascinating. I mean, this is what I've always loved about Bitcoin conceptually, the the UTXO model and being able, able to parallelize transactions that give you this ability to just keep kind of creating branches as you play with it. And, you know, Ethereum is, I think a lot of people might not understand Ethereum at a, at a basic level, that it is itself uh, creating a global state, if I if I explain it right, that it's essentially just a global computer and you can use it if you pay gas to use it, but it's very limited. Whereas in Bitcoin, you can create, in theory, an infinite amount of global states that can interact. Is that correct? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. So in, in Ethereum, yeah, there is one global state where in, in Bitcoin, so if I talk, take this example I just said of, okay, I, I follow one chain of transactions. So that this starts as just a Bitcoin output and then some data gets attached to it and some state transitions get attached to it. And now it looks like whatever. That's kind of one sandbox of state. Like that's its own local state. Um, but you can at the same time have, yeah, like you said, essentially unlimited of those. Every every UTXO that exists can have its own state. And you could even have state, wind or state, I don't exactly know the word, the technical word for it, but that kind of overlap where one is its own state, but it also falls underneath this other big window of state. So we can have, I mean, within our, uh, so fixed gaming is the company is our, is our company that's building crypto fights. Yep. And so like within our environment, like we have a whole fixed gaming view of the blockchain. And if it didn't happen through the fixed gaming servers, we don't care about it. It doesn't interact with anything that came from us. We don't, it, it's just, it's out in the blockchain world. Other people can scale with it. Other people can, build on it. We don't care. But the stuff that's through our through our window is all we have to worry about storing. And and within that, there's going to be a, a subset of data that's all crypto fights data. That that fits into the fixed gaming data. And it's mm. also the, the the crypto fights data. And so within sure. that, then there's going to be smaller <laughs> windows of okay, here's an actual player's battles or here's a battle itself or here's a fighter and here's the changes it's gone through. Um, and so at any point, yeah, you can the network itself is really just processing spending of UTXOs. And so it can sure. it can handle as many of those as it wants and they can affect as many different views of data as, as you have. And you can interpret that data in as many different ways as you want, so. Yeah, it's, that's fascinating. I, I mean, why do you think, well, and I have my theories about Ethereum and why people started Ethereum. And I think a lot of people say, hey, I wanna program something cool on the blockchain and then therefore uh, just simply because they have so much market share in that concept, uh, people go that direction. But is what do you think is a good way to express this to a wider audience to say, hey, you know, if if you have actual you know complex computation, they're you know zk rollups and and they're off chain stuff and plasma and all these things only kind of exist in theory. And so Ethereum is very much a coming soon network itself. Like, how how do we get people to leapfrog spending a year? with Ethereum before they get to a place that can actually handle a big idea. Yeah, well, it's hard because in some ways, Ethereum provides a very familiar programmer interface in that, yeah. I mean, the, the idea of I call a function, it changes the state. Um, I mean, if you think of the Ethereum state as a database um, that mm. says, okay, I call this function, it updates this record in the database and it's it's really easy for programmers to grasp, um, mm -hmm. and you can anything that you can write on a graphing calculator, you can write on on Ethereum. Um, it sure. just might cost you several hundred dollars to run it. Um, <laughs> yeah, but it's it's just you're sharing that little bit of processing power across everyone in the world, and it, that yeah. just can't yeah. work. But it's really easy to get up to speed on, and some of that okay. is because. Um, in some ways, I think they they went so far as to make a really familiar programming interface and programming mm -hmm. just the way that it works is really simple. And it's if you were learning how to build how to program code on your on a little Raspberry Pi, it might be very similar to um, the, the way you would go about writing software. But then that, in some ways, oversimplified things to the point that to actually do anything with it you get all this like, okay, we need another layer for this complexity. We need another layer for this complexity. We have to build in sharding and we have to build in um, atomic swaps to side chains. And we like all this stuff that's 
none of it is actually like none of it really exists yet. It's all okay. I'm sure we can get this such that proof of stake is a proven um, economic model that is going to work. Well, that may be, but it hasn't been proven yet where Bitcoin is proof of work and it, it's been proven mm -hmm. over 12 years that this works. Right. Um, <laughs> and sure. so, yeah, maybe you can come up with all the ways to make that work in the world. But, and then on the Bitcoin side, you definitely have to get, like you have, a Bitcoin transaction as a base tool. And that has built into it authentication. It has built into it a data packet, a way of packetizing data. It has ordering of data so that I can say this comes after that because it spends like the inputs of this transaction spend the outputs of the previous transaction. So there ends mm -hmm. up being ordering built into it. So you get value sure. transfer, you get data, you get authentication, you get ordering, which essentially is time all in one Bitcoin transaction. And so once you start thinking at a lower level of, I mean, in some ways, yes, we're still using the internet and yes, we're still using regular programming paradigms, yeah. but at the same point, the tool you have is this, the atomic unit of a transaction provides so much value in one piece that you can really start slicing and dicing how you use the different parts of that transaction mm -hmm. in really powerful ways. It's just, as a developer, you have to kind of dig deeper and, and break out of the, oh, I can just write this little simple code and it's gonna work, right. where it's really no, I have to construct these transactions in such a way that they give me the same value that I would get. Oh, that's fascinating to me, first of all, because I think so few people, uh, I'm reading a comment here from Roy Murphy saying, true story, if I hadn't studied how David referenced files and implemented the BCAP protocol, there wouldn't be a 300 or a 638 megabyte block on BSV today. Uh, it, it's it's really interesting hearing you think through that path of, you know, how do I start at a problem and make my way to a proposed solution and then actually figure the solution out? Because I think just, just like you said, if somebody just understands basic databasing and then they see Ethereum and they're like, oh, okay, I recognize this. And they may not look into the game theory of it because how many people are <laughs> going to spend a ton of time, you know, understanding why they should go somewhere else when, it seems like the crowd is at Ethereum, but uh, Roy also saying, I want to thank uh, David Case for his work on Bottle Uploader. It inspired apps like Beco Media and Bitcoin Files. It inspired me too. Thanks, David. So you're welcome, Roy. Yeah, you're getting some getting some <laughs> some praise there, and well, and I think it's it's really uh, really merited because there are so few people, I, and I talk to people in Ethereum all the time, and they're like, well, why would I do that? Ethereum does everything I need, plus all the liquidity and it's like, well, how many how many users does your app have? How many transactions do you need to generate in a minute or an hour or a day and, and that kind of thing? Well, you know, the, like they don't even have the figures, which means it's, you know, it's a collateral thing. Like they're buying it, it's sitting somewhere, and then theoretically value is occurring somewhere else. But do you think, I guess back to my, my original question, like how do we bridge that gap? Is it like a tooling issue? Do we need more people to build more SDKs that sort of take away some of the you know mystery or, or what do you think? Uh, maybe, but we're getting there. Like some of the tools like Run, which we're built on. Um, mm -hmm. So run.network, definitely go check it out. It's it's kind of like, it, it allows that, that second layer I was talking about to be JavaScript code. And so from a developer standpoint, it, that part is actually easier now to, to grasp than Ethereum having to learn Solidity or whatever there, there's another Python derivative that works. I don't remember yeah. what it's called. Um, that like, so it's getting to the point that tooling is there. Now the infrastructure tooling, I will say this last year has come a long way and it is getting to the point now where it needs to be. Um, but just the whole concept around around scalable Bitcoin and big, big block Bitcoin does mean that as a business, you are probably going to need to either build some more of that infrastructure yourself or find a good partner to, to handle some of that. Because mm -hmm. um, like I mentioned how things are represented as a series of state changes that are recorded mm. on the blockchain. Well, if I'm trying to interact with that quickly, I can't go all the way back and recalculate every step of everything along the yeah. way. I need to have some intermediate um, proofs that either I trust because I wrote the game and I've already calculated them or that, right. that I've got some sort of a, I mean, maybe there's even a, a, a legal arrangement that says, okay, if you provide me something that causes me to come to it, 
to a bad outcome, then maybe there's an insurance or what, like any way you want to structure sure. it. At some yeah, point, yeah. getting fast access to pre-calculated states of things, that's an infrastructure piece and that needs to be there. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. so that's something that, I mean, that, that's a lot of the stuff that we've been building out for the last year is just a lot of the infrastructure needed to to be able to do what we can do in crypto fights. Sure. Uh, it brings up another point. I've talked to Dean Little and a couple other guys who talk about the need for sort of an intermediate um, like GPU accelerator, like people maybe that can partner with miners or somewhere in between uh, that are doing that kind of thing. Like, hey, th- these processes make sense to accelerate with GPUs. Uh, he, he really seems to like that idea. It's a little over my head as to why, but, uh, do you see that as a solution? Maybe a second level of, of miners that play with the overlay networks or something like that. So one of the downfalls with Bitcoin is that you can really, I mean, this was about a year and a half ago, almost a meme of like Bitcoin solves that or so. And it really, yeah. and those of us who got super nerdy into it is really bit called Bitcoin can solve everything. Um, yeah. And some of that actually is a disservice because it, it really, I mean, you look at why we don't have real settled token standards right now. It's because you can do things so many different ways and it's a wide open, like I say, what yeah. you're really working on is this, just this packet of a transaction and you can, you can interact with that in countless ways. And sure. so the same thing goes for second layer where that opens up even more of really what I'm stating mm-hmm. is an ordered authenticated series of anything. And so if those are if those are rendering pipeline instructions, well, mm-hmm. that's great. If those are a video game, if those are crypto fights where you're saying, okay, I want to attack this person or I want to cast my hide spell or heal, um, <laughs> It, it can be that if it, if it's yeah. a social media post that says, okay, I'm replying to this other social, like it can be that. And so coming down to getting standards that, that people, I mean, you're not going to get to, this is the right way, but just getting enough right. volume of people that are doing things a way. Um, mm-hmm. And I think something like run really helps with that because there does start to be um, processes where, my crypto fights items. If if I do if I do a, a if I partner with Tonic Pow such that if you refer someone to our site and they come in, we drop you a crypto fight sword that's got. Um, but that owning that crypto fight sword maybe also gives you a discount on more Tonic Pow. I don't know, like or yeah, or yeah, yeah. USDC rewards or whatever we want to do. <laughs> All these different tokens can start having the logic or start playing with the logic of each other and that I don't need sure. to run the U S wrapped USDC. Uh, Jack can do that at, at relay. Um, but I can use that and I can, right. I can drop that or reward that. So, so that begs a question, you know, I've often said we probably need to establish some kind of a token protocol that we all kind of agree is the best for interoperability, but would you agree? Can we have, three or four or five token protocols that maybe are able to handshake and play nice? Or what do you think? Um, I think there's, there's going to be certainly for things that have value that, I mean, anything that is a token that we're trying to, to trade through some centralized value, whether that be dollars Mm -hmm. or whatever things that are valuable. um, There's always going to need to be an exchange layer of something that says, okay, let me turn this into that. And I think there can be plenty of, I mean, within different token ecosystems, like within Run, it's certainly easy to build atomic swaps. Um, I'm sure that within a lot of the other token standards, it's easy to build atomic swaps. Now, whether or not you can build them across each other that says, okay, I'm going to give you one of the old Shua coins, not the uh, Run yeah, wrap yeah, Shua yeah. coins. And right. that, I mean, there needs to be someone building that that process in between. Um, sure. I think there's going to be quite a few different standards, though, because I think like when people are tokenizing um, art or or collectible cards, and it's really all we've got is you're just trading this from one person to another. Well, that mm-hmm. could that could fall on a fairly simplified token standard. But sure. if what we're saying is okay, here's I'm I'm tokenizing licensing rights to this music file um, that. Um, that every time you play it, a thousandth of a penny is going to is getting split amongst the contributors of like <laughs> right. that's going to need the to be band of the producers standard. and the company, yeah. <laughs> um, so and there's going to sure. be a lot of those of really mm-hmm. 
domain specific token standards that might not even really be exactly. token standards. I mean, that's where things, the whole concept of tokens, once you start having interactive programmability beyond just, I have this, it has some value and I'm trading with you. And maybe it has a little bit of data right. stored with it. But once these tokens can grow and change based on rules that are programmed into them, and they're running mm -hmm. on a virtual machine that actually can support more than a few, a few instructions, well, yeah. then standards are actually quite hard that you need to come up with mm -hmm. really domain-specific standards, which means there might be a lot of them. Um, and sure. it might be for us to interact with someone in, in the FIX platform you really need to use, you need to inherit from our token class or, or even yeah, just yeah. in the, just in the run environment. I mean, they provide mm -hmm. a, a base. Here's a value token that uh, here's a non-fungible right. token standard. Um, so if you inherit that's from right. that, well, then we can trade with each other. Sure. That makes sense. I, I like to tell people, you know, I don't know how many people on the stream are, are technical. Uh, so I like to break tokens into like a token is a type of smart contract. But a smart contract, I think, is a is a little bit of a weird term because I think people aren't sure what the hell that means. So I tell people it's it's an app, it's a program. So it is a thing which follows rules, uh, which is what everything is that you use on a computer or a phone or whatever. So smart contracts are are flexible in that you can make them do whatever you can program them to do. Do you, do you think that's a fair uh, representation? Would you add or take away anything from that? Uh, I actually think that there's some. Gen one or gen two, I don't know what gen we're on um, of crypto development terms that just need to die. Um, <laughs> and even token somewhat falls into that, but certainly smart contract. Um, yeah. I mean, those are almost ways of let me come up with, I mean, so with, with the concept of a token, like Bitcoin, one of the things that when it became big is it, people talking about the description of what cash is and fungibility is one of the, um, one of the, Defin defining parameters of, of what cash is. And yep. so when different colored coin tokens come out, those are just another form of fungible tokens. Well, then someone decides to come up with a, a unique token that isn't fungible. And so we, we kind of like stick this other term of non-fungible tokens to, to differentiate from fungible tokens. When in reality, we've got, we're getting to the point now where that whole legacy of, okay, this is, this is just a token that's represented like, it, it almost doesn't even apply uh, in in this world. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I, I like that. Um, <laughs> can, and smart contracts the same way. Well, right. Yeah. They, they're all just, I think they're terms. <laughs> it's funny that I think of them as terms that are used to like raise money from people that don't understand what the hell is being discussed. Be like, well, this is a smart contract and does these different, and it's like, so you're an app developer. This is, it's an app. <laughs> But uh, we got a question from uh, Sir Toshi uh, saying, David, why is your handle Shrugger? Um, because I really suck at making unimportant decisions. Um, <laughs> and I mean, that's usually my answer usually is to shrug at someone. Um, that's, that's and good. Someone, someone gave that. Um, yeah, someone just gave that to me as a nickname. It was actually just the shrug emoji is what they gave me as a nickname. And and I live in Grand Rapids. So the GR, I just kind of like took it on as shrug Grand Rapids and it's shrugger. Oh, that's funny. Okay. <laughs> that's pretty great. So there you have it. A little bit of uh, nuggets nuggets of, of, of inside information about uh, the enigmatic David Case. <laughs> So let's let's talk specifically about crypto fights a bit. Um, it's been a project that I have been super excited about since we first met. Uh, when the first time we shook hands, you're hey, I'm the lead developer of crypto fights, and I didn't know what the hell that was, but uh, you showed us, and I just think it's awesome. Like you know, turn turn based games um, are super popular. They continue to grow in popularity uh, to the point where we're even seeing leagues and and all kinds of things uh, really building up around them uh, to the point where esports, I believe are making more money and, or, and or spending more money than like major league baseball and, and the NFL and all of these things now. So uh, you've created, or you're creating something that is, uh, I mean, h huge. I, I don't even think there's a word to explain, you know, what it means to be bigger than the NFL uh, in, <laughs> well. in, in participation, but uh what's what's the status what can we uh what can we expect is there a roadmap when when do i get to play some damn crypto fights david <laughs> so um 
with a caveat that I always, always, always underestimate um, complexity of things. But I mean, we are running on testnet right now. Um, I mean, we had there had been some some sample runs on testnet before, but as of last night, uh, things mm -hmm. are up and running on testnet. Um, things are playing out. Um, we have, I mean, essentially the the core pieces are all there. Um, and they're all there fully working with the Bitcoin blockchain, Bitcoin SV. Um, the, there's still like, we've, we've been working on our whole cashier system. So there's still a couple things that we're, we're finalizing our sponsorship with the banks, um, that we've got, I mean, we've been working on that for a year of due diligence and process. And that's, I mean, that's really, really close and everything's looking very promising such that we'll be able to take fiat, uh, currencies, um, and, so crypto fights, yeah, it's it's soon as what unfortunately <laughs> things still are, but um, For sure. but within a few days, I'm hoping that we're going to be able to drop a testnet build to our mm. uh, Telegram channel, which I think well, actually, we'll probably throw it on our website once we know that things are are good there, nice. um, and people can start testing on testnet. Now, nothing is going to transfer over from testnet to mainnet, uh, and we may even end up resetting the account still a few times until we're we're really sure that everything is um, is really solid because once we get on mainnet, um, if something screws up and some rules aren't implemented correctly, and your fighter is screwed up forever, well, that's that <laughs> yeah, means that we either need to build in ways to recreate what you did, yeah. or so we just we're trying to be really really diligent that what sure. gets out there on mainnet is. I mean, people are putting money on these things, and so yeah. and while we can refund money, we can't. I mean, it's it's in that this is a this is a state machine of things that have actually happened. I, I can't recreate that says you did all these things, but this other this yep. other code shouldn't have been implemented. Like it's out there, so sure um, makes sense. Yeah, so it's got to be perfect before you deploy. It and doesn't then it's have to be perfect. perfect. Like, forever. <laughs> I mean, there's there's certain pieces that it's modular enough that like okay, if yeah. we have a bug in our in our code where you're fighting a player and you do an attack and it miscalculates the output. Well, we're not going to go in back and change that how that battle should have turned out. We'll mm -hmm. we'll make it ready right for whoever didn't get the uh, the money that they should have because things screwed sure. up and we'll fix and it's modular enough that we can fix that from that point on the attack action is now going to calculate things properly. Um, mm -hmm. but if your fighter gets corrupted such that it's it's mm -hmm. not a fighter anymore, it's a unusable blob of data, well, we don't mm -hmm. really want that to be possible yeah well i mean so so if craig wright's character uh gets screwed up he can just go get a court order and issue <laughs> that to, to straighten out his, his fighter right <laughs> i mean we <laughs> we could probably program a series of bots for him to fight that would level him up to the right character i guess but perfect but yeah <laughs> no but i mean every everything of ours still has to mimic the blockchain so uh yeah, for sure yeah so the miners would have to change it and then we would have to update to reflect what the miners now Got believe it. is the truth so that's <laughs> that's an interesting question so could uh mempool or somebody like they just reorg the chain if they lose they can make themselves win or they can play infinitely if they keep reorging their block <laughs> um so i mean <laughs> The same data, the same double spend protections as the rest of the network has. I mean, because yeah. really, when you take a turn, you're you're spending a standard pay to public key hash output. Sure. So, if you can double spend the network, you can double spend crypto fights. Um, Got it. We have signatures of proofs that you signed both uh, transactions, so you've already okay, proven sure. to the world that you did that, and yeah, expect uh, ramifications for that. And <laughs> sure. And if you're playing for money, I mean, we do have, we do have a KYC process, and that's part of what we're going through with the bank. And everything is fully, um, yeah. If, if someone starts really scamming and ripping people off, we know who you are, and got it. And we ha we have even if we can't necessarily catch it immediately the first time you've done it, we've got the full chain, and the whole community has the full chain of everything right. that's happened. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's immutable proof forever, <laughs> so that, not a good place to initiate a, a scam or a, a theft. So right. makes sense. Uh, we got Morning Worm asking, can we repurpose existing tokens like Shua to be a two hundred thousand dollar weapon? I, it's, uh, it's funny. I, I imagine if you're both using the same standard, you know why why not accept uh, tokens in your marketplace to buy 
you know, yeah, XP I mean, or something. for some of the regulation purposes that we're trying to make sure we we don't go too far afield of, and we we stay in the in the yeah in the positive view of the Mastercards <laughs> of the world. Sure. Um, we, I mean, we have our own token that's essentially, I mean, it's essentially the exact same thing as the RelayX USDC token. It's just sure. not wrapping USDC. So for mm -hmm. that, people will deposit money into an account on our side and they will get mm -hmm. the, it doesn't have a formal name yet, but the, but one uh, to get, one it's currently thing. called ChronoCoin because of our recent rename, but I'm sure it will be yeah. fixed something. Sure. Um and Xbox. yeah, and that's, I mean, <laughs> and those just live in your wallet. And so when you yeah. enter a battle that you put a dollar on, you transfer a dollar of that into the, that battle. And when that battle is done, if you win, you get a dollar and 80 cents out. If you lose, you don't mm -hmm. get anything back out. And then when you want to cash out of the system, you transfer those, those tokens to our cashier and that cashier deposits money in your account, um, in your bank account. So cool. it's, yeah, it's just a, simple so that actually brings another really powerful um feature of of kind of running your business on the blockchain is our accounting system doesn't exist like it it is bitcoin is our accounting system and so sure. how many of those tokens you have is your balance and if you want to cash mm -hmm. out those balance you transfer those tokens and and then we exit that system and we destroy those co coins and you deposit in your mm -hmm. account but that is the accounting system that's awesome. No, I, I think that's really, uh, really important, actually. So since we had uh, Becky Legero on uh, two weeks ago, I've, I've talked to a couple of her casino uh, contacts who are like, ah, blockchain is just a waste of time and it's it's not going to work because of X, Y, and Z. Um, and, and that was one of the things I said is like, well, what, you know, what's your background or what's your back end accounting infrastructure look like and what, what costs are associated with it? Because exactly that, you could accept payments, turn them into tokens, and then let people do whatever work they're doing. And then as soon as they're cashed out, the accounting's done. It's it's there, it's on chain. And and he's like, well, is that how that, you know, it's, it's, it's funny watching people process in their head after having looked at Ethereum or whatever three years ago and, and saying, nah, this doesn't work. And here's why, but uh, we actually do have uh, a lot of interesting things um, like that. Uh, we have a question here uh, saying, do you think Games like Call of Duty Warzone will no longer have the amount of hackers if it was built on top of BSV. Is it is it possible? What are we? So hackers is an interesting uh, term as it is. I I don't. Yeah. I'm actually not a huge. Uh, I guess I'll say active action gamer. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm not real big on on those uh, knowing what's going on in that community or anything. But certainly the tools are there um, to it's really just a matter of how much of the game and the game logic and the game validation do you want to run through through the blockchain. And then there's still many, many use cases that do require, like even crypto fights, we're still an active participant in the game. But what mm -hmm. we're doing is contributing random numbers and timestamps that we're signing. Um, and so it, it's more about having a full audit trail and having a full, the ability to go through and see what all happened. And that, that logic all builds on each other. That if we said that a turn happened two minutes later than it did, well, the mm -hmm. logic would say that you took too long and it skipped your turn. Um, right. and so the logic would play out based on what we answer. So the, there is still a centralized aspect of this, that anything you're doing, you're choosing to trust us as, uh, as an Oracle essentially. Sure. Um, but you can actually use the full crypto fights game logic and trust a different Oracle or trust anyone else mm. because they can, I mean, when you set it up, you're saying, okay, I'm playing this and I'm trusting that this person is. And so if you want to mm -hmm. even run a little raspberry Pi that's running the crypto fights validation code in your closet, um, mm -hmm. You can run your own validator. Now we're a little ways away from figuring out how to actually modulize that, but you can pull the code yeah. off chain and point to it. And I mean, it's cool. everything is open. Everything is out there. So we can so we can attract small blockers who want to validate their own crypto fights. That's uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> so good, good times. I'll, I'll have to let some of my old friends know that that's an option. Uh, that's that's pretty cool. Uh, do, do you see any um, any version of reality where you release like an SDK that? Uh, allows some of your work to be used by other people to implement games more easily. Yeah, yeah. and there's already a couple. I don't really want to publicize them yet because they're not very clean. But we do have a couple mm -hmm. of public GitHub repos um, that are 
going through pretty active cleanup in preparation for, um, I mean, th there's been a lot of really rapid changes in the last few months. Yeah. Um, sure. And so I, I don't really want to support those at all yet. But yeah, the whole idea is ideally, I mean, within within Fix, um, there's a number of services. Like we've got a whole account management. We've got our whole cashier system. Um, all that's going to be open for anyone else to tie into and use. Um, and those those contracts are recorded on chain as, as Run um, does. Nice. So yeah. there's no reason you can't interact with um, interact with our system on that level. That's really um, cool. And then ideally, I mean, the long the long big picture is that we can actually build out entire gaming ecosystems that interact with each other. So, mm. um, like like I was mentioning, concepts of someone gamifying something else, and that maybe gives you some magic dust that you can spark sprinkle on your sword in crypto fights, which then gives you a magic mod or a a modifier, we don't have magic, we mm -hmm. have an intelligence, but um, the modifier <laughs> that would then, like you can you can start really crossing paths that, yeah. um, I mean, if you refer someone via Twitch or via Tonic Pow and they come in, then you get a mm -hmm. chest that has Satoshis in it. Like you can, yeah. we can really start crossing the worlds in pretty, pretty yeah. cool ways. Well, that's that's the power of of the public ledger. It, it's funny you, you've mentioned Tonic Pow a couple of times, and I, I talked to Luke about this uh, probably once or twice a month. He's like, "Why aren't apps all interacting in a way that allows the you know exactly that like gamifying on top of gamifying on top of gamifying? Because all the data is there. You just gotta have somebody that connects it and, and creates uh, you know scavenger hunts and other things that allow you to find." little bits of data across the network and, and get rewarded for them. So I think that's, um, that's what I'm really excited about, especially cause I'm, I'm so heavily immersed in all of the apps. I feel like I'd be like, if not the King of, but one of the Dukes, uh, who is able to get all of those special, uh, <laughs> those special dispensations for, for using all the apps. So that's, uh, that's really exciting to me. Um, we have a, a question here, uh, back to a previous thought, uh, is ETH just a low barrier to start with? Uh, stupid experiment, and only once people need industrial things, they'll see and really learn BSV. Do you think, like, I think that's an important question that that we should answer systematically at some point. Like, how can people just take the little leap and and move over to a chain that actually works before wasting I, too much time? Yeah, and I certainly don't want to give this too much influence and it might not ever be seen, but I really think having some more complex things like what we're doing or, mm -hmm. I mean, there's no, numerous other projects that are soon um, in, in sure. BSV that I, I feel like once they get out there and people start realizing, the technical people start realizing, oh, this yeah. is this is an entirely different ball game than what we were talking about before. Mm -hmm. um, I think that will help from a from a people from a developer standpoint of like people who are really wanting to get problem solved and to yep. realize that this is this is tooling that is out there um, yep. and it works and you don't really need to wait for anything else to be developed it, it's there um, but at the same time I mean, there's just there's such a call from the, the the siren song of I can make a billion dollars from a st right. stupid token right, run, on ethereum run this on a dumb token and the business doesn't actually have to work <laughs> you're rich anyways right uh i i think that's first of all super noble uh i mean you've i know you've been working on this for about three years now and when it's all up and going you get to be this gigantic proof of concept of why why this massive ecosystem needed to move from ethereum to bsv so i would expect you to be referenced heavily once people are using the game uh and that's pretty exciting um and then roy murphy is asking on on that point david if you weren't at crypto fights what bsv tools and protocols would you be working on first which is yeah in there how would we it's get actually, there right? that's an interesting question because there are times and i certainly don't have any regrets right now where we're at but there are definitely been times over the last couple of years where i wish that we would have shot for something a little less ambitious um because mm -hmm. There is definitely a lot of the the little bits of tooling that I end up building myself kind of half-assed and quickly to do what we need for this for this use case. That it would really kind of be fun to just be a, a nutty professor that's building and and Roy mentioned earlier this bottle uploader tool. And there's a couple yep. tools that when 
when I first started digging into this space, Unwriter had re released a number of just kind of infrastructure tools. Mm -hmm. um, and one of them was Bottle Browser. So Bottle Browser was essentially just a very, very simplified web browser that would reference web pages that were stored as these B files on the blockchain. And then, so within the contents of those files could be hyperlinks to other B files. So essentially you're building right. just a web browser. And so I built this simple little page on there that was just like, lets you upload a file and it would, and at the time, like each transaction had a hundred thousand, um, or a hundred kilobyte limit of what you could do in an output of a transaction. So I built this little tool that would actually let you fund it and it would split it up mm. into pieces and it would upload it to multiple chunks. Um, and then you could from one link kind of pull down all those chunks and get the bigger than hundred K file. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I think there's a lot of, I, I don't know that I necessarily, if I weren't focused on the business and getting this stuff out the door, um, there's probably a lot of just like little tooling pieces right there, little infrastructure mm -hmm. pieces that would be hobbies more than anything else. Sure. Um, but at this point in my life and in my career and on our business, I mean, the drive of to actually get paid, <laughs> like not, not get paid <laughs> sure. big, but like um, yeah. keep having a job, revenue, not, not having to go work for someone else. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I, this is, and it's, I mean, it's an exciting project and it feels like, yeah. I mean, there's a number of people on here who have known me and slightly followed me, even though I don't post anything. I, I'm really quiet on social media and it, yeah. I mean, it's nice to get like, kind of have some recognition for just like, all right, what I'm doing, although it's been a slog at times and although it's been frustrating at times and I've rebuilt certain pieces eight times. Um, <laughs> it feels nice to finally have something on the outside that says, all right, there's a lot of lessons learned here. And I probably will talk yeah. to you because I am starting to feel like, a lot of the lessons I've learned, I'm not the greatest at like, okay, let me prep something to present to people. But mm -hmm. I do think there is some opportunity from a developer standpoint to just start kind of talking through some different pieces of, okay, how do we do random number generation? How do we do uh, key generation from login systems? How do we do... And I think from there, there probably could be some standards that get developed of, okay, how do we do password recovery amongst multiple parties um, yeah. such that a user actually can reset their password without having to have their keys um, or whatever else. So, yeah, uh, I just want to point out a couple of people are saying, Hey, smash the like button. I, I, I should be that host. That's like, Hey guys, uh, smash, smash the like subscribe, share, share across social media. Uh, you know, David, David is a, a, a very important person in the space. I think he's going to continue to become, uh, I actually, David, I have a prediction. I think you're going to be, particularly popular once this fully launches and, and people say like, Oh my God, I didn't know that any of this was possible on uh, first of all, any blockchain, but, but second of all, everyone's uh, you know, the blockchain that everybody thinks doesn't actually exist and isn't actually being developed on or anything else. So um, I, I'm looking forward to your victory parade. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, you will be invited if that happens. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to hear it. Uh, can uh, I actually got, show off for a second quick now that I, you mentioned that? I would love to see what you got. So people um, people can see what you're, you're working on. There, there, There's some good – sorry, I had to read my my private chat from the delightful Alex Moon, my executive producer here. But uh, also, uh, how are you on time? Do you have anything going on after this? Or I, have, for a while? I have no limits at all. I have set aside the afternoon Excellent. for you, Kurt. Love it. So yeah, if, if you would be so kind as to share your screen, uh, we can see a little bit of a preview of what's going on in crypto fights. All right. So, uh, Ooh, there's no images there. <laughs> Maybe let's go. I did not actually, I did not actually warn these guys not to deploy any test stuff. So hopefully, uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So yeah. All right. I'll go full screen. Um, and switch. So this is CryptoVites. And I actually saw a question scroll by. Um, yes, our, our initial release platforms are going to be Windows and Android. Um, so whoever asked if you're going to be able to play it on a, on a desktop, uh, there will be a Windows build. Um, so I'm not going to go through all the details here. I'm going to leave some things hanging. But I did want to show a couple pieces that really illustrate um, kind of what makes this unique as far as a, a system. So. Um, I've got in here, this is my caravan where I've got my fighter. And so this fighter is, uh, to use the word that doesn't mean anything, a, a non-fungible token. This fighter lives as a crypto or as a, as a Bitcoin UTXO, and it's got a whole series of transactions that have gotten him 
leveled up to the point where he is right now. Um, so actually, before I even go through the game side, I want to then show we have a data explorer here. So this mm. Zach is the same. Uh, well, that's my login name. Where's his name? I don't know if we should. Oh, there we go. Zach. So this is the same guy. So I can click in to Zach right here on our data explorer. And this is going to show me, okay, currently Zach is on level four. He has max hit points of 23. He's got these skills. Um, he's got strength of 12, dexterity of, of 11, intelligence of 12. But I can also then go through and see here's every battle that Zach has ever fought in before. And um, Zach, I just created last night. I played against a couple of our bots. So these are all Bogart, Knoll, Quaist, Ogre. These are just bots that we've got fighting. But it would show up the exact same way if we we're playing against real people. Um, and then I can click into any one of those historical battles and I can see, okay, at that point in time, Zach had 19 hit points. Um, uh, here are the details. Okay, there's a dollar entry fee. And then here's every single um, action that ever happened in that battle. But I can also click on this little link right here, which will go and show on on a block explorer. Like here is the actual Bitcoin transaction that happened that mm -hmm. made that battle go from I don't remember which one I clicked on, but that that was Quaist using curse or Zach using attack. Let's see if we can actually make sense of this. So if I look at this data right here, um, mm -hmm. and I'm just going to stick it in a whoop, oops a mode JSON. If I can learn to type. <laughs> okay, so here, um, okay, it's all, there. It, it, it's not in, I can't tell you what it is just from looking exactly what it is. But anyway, so, and the, this is, the, what's in the Bitcoin transaction is essentially a little bit of header information, all the information that tracks what, um, what the inputs were. So this is like who owned what and what Zach looked like at that point in time. Actually, I can tell you this was Zach at that point in time, or this was the battle at that point in time. Um, and then that battle, someone called something that's all encoded in this blob. And what we have out now is this new output that is the battle at that new state in time. So we end up with like every bit of everything that happens actually being recorded in such a way that we can walk through it and can click through from one thing to another thing to another thing, which is where the whole graph of data gets really, really cool. Yeah. Um, and then to actually show the game a little bit. So I'm just gonna, so I have in, in fighting those couple bots and starting up, I have a couple different weapons that I can choose and all of them, these are all also non-fungible tokens. So, um, I, I have a quarter strap got dropped to me, which also, if so, I they, look, so they should go up 10 X in value, uh, by the end of the show because they're well, NFTs, right? <laughs> well, these are on blockchain that I'm or on test net and I'm likely going to wipe, yeah. wipe them out, but <laughs> <laughs> nice. But within with soon, soon yeah. <laughs> um, so you can also see like this this battle right here, the reward that got dropped was a practice quarter staff. So because there's not much data in here, I actually know that that is this practice quarter staff right here got dropped mm -hmm. dropped from that what, that battle. But again, these are also NFTs that also have all their data stored on chain. So you can for any of it, the entire provenance of this quarter staff traces back to that battle but if i if i level up a bunch of times and then i fight in some big competition and then i can sell you next year the same quarter staff that i won that competition mm -hmm. with and <laughs> that is that quarter staff even if there are a thousand other quarter staffs that all look exactly the same this is this is sting or this is a name essentially a something that has its own history to it its own for sure um so i'm just gonna I'm just going to dual wield right now. Um, <laughs> I've got a, all right, a mace in one hand, a, a short sword in another hand. Don't have any hats or helmets right now. Um, and so then as I've leveled up, I've also like picked additional skills I can use and additional traits. So one of these things like gives me a benefit um, for a bonus for attacking if I'm dual wielding. So I am dual wielding. So that's a benefit there. All right, so then I'm going to go, and this dungeons are kind of like your initial, these are bots that you're fighting, and they drop some weapons, and they allow you to level up and kind of get yourself to a point where you're going to want to fight other individuals. Um, so you got to work yourself up to level 7 before you can fight other people. Otherwise, you're mm -hmm. just fighting bots. And right now, the bot logic is super simple. And so, like, although I say that, this, uh, this ogre has beat me three times in a row setting up for this. So we'll see if... 
we'll see how that goes. Um, I'm literally picturing myself putting like my staff or my mace in my will for a moment <laughs> someday. Oh, what's going on? All right. Ogre's joining me. So, um, so if I were back on that other page, this battle would actually have popped in and start and, and be updating as, as we fight this out. So mm -hmm. I only have three different skills attacked here. I can hide from him, which I'll do first. Um, I don't usually hide is not normally in my, uh, play approach, but yeah. and I missed, so I didn't even hide. Um, <laughs> All right, so he's probably gonna wallop me again. Boom. And every everything I click here and everything that this bot does, all mm -hmm. are individual Bitcoin transactions that all play off of each other. Mm -hmm. So like the battle gets awesome. set up, that battle output gets spent um, on the input and the next uh, stage of the battle and then that output gets spent on the input of the next stage of the next battle. And we just kind of go through until the end where magically some rewards pop out um, and mm -hmm and some money gets paid to people and it's all, all that code is just built in JavaScript. Um, Incredible. This is beautiful by the way. I mean, the, the UI is like fantastic. Yeah. That's what they've been doing while I've been struggling with the back end. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh Oh, of course the demo gods have struck. I literally threw this together in the middle of the night last night. So on testnet. <laughs> so there's probably something sure. anyways, demo over. Um, Actually, I can tell the battle did finish. So okay. this right here, this battle token tells me that. Oh, in fact, battle completed. I don't know what happened, but anyways. <laughs> oh, it's cool. So we can kill the, uh, the demo screen. That's, I mean, that's exciting. So first of all, like I said, it looks beautiful. Uh, the fact that you're doing each click of a button is, is an on-chain action, I think is, I mean, just awesome. Got Alex Agut here, very polished UI, the the king of of UI yeah. design and in, in Bitcoin here, yeah, giving I you the shout out. Take that as uh, props. I have very little to do with that UI. I will just let everyone know that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I, my, I guess the first thing that that pops into my head is: is there a limit to how many people can play at a time? Is that an infrastructure issue on your end? What are you planning um, for? Not. I mean, there really isn't. Um, now, certainly, we need to make sure that. Our so because I mean the validation of of a transaction is happening all with miners. So really, we just pass that on to a well connected or a excuse me a series of well connected miners that we know there's enough hash enough hash power that this is not going to get double spent. Mm -hmm. um, and then from that point, we are just trusting double spend protections within that miner network to say, okay, this is this is good at that point. If this is good enough for financial transactions, this is good enough for for a game where people have two dollars on the game, um, <laughs> right. um, and then from that point, we certainly do do a, a fair number of indexing and and things like that. But we just need to make sure that our our databases that have caches of that information are scaled far enough to be able to handle mm -hmm. all the reads and writes that are happening from that database, which is just normal scaling. I mean, that's every game in the world needs to build out that same kind of complexity. Sure. Um, now, as soon as you start decentralizing the the validation of it as soon as like that's if you're playing on, on our system but if someone else wants to stand up their own instances well then you're just limited by whatever they want to scale so on a global level there isn't there isn't any scale ceiling um <laughs> to, uh, to, to quote satoshi <laughs> that's, that's awesome so, bonus points so alex send him some uh some moon coins or kirk coins or something <laughs> i don't know <laughs> that's that's great uh we got charlie comment saying uh do you see bsv paving a way to a ready player one scenario and is this something you're developing <laughs> so are you uh, developing <laughs> ready player one for all of us david is that your next problem um, yeah i guess i am but it's a uh, long ways out um no <laughs> So there is still like right now we're using a lot of JavaScript based tooling and run is based on JavaScript. Um, and as far as development efficiency goes, it's great for that. As far as runtime efficiency goes, it's not. Um, mm -hmm. And, and there's some things in how run protocol does some things that um, I know they're actively working on improving some aspects of the cache layer so that things can be even quicker, but there's yep. still a fair amount of like each turn, each one of those, those transactions there, there's some, um, 
there's some delays involved. So real-time <laughs> gaming, um, although there's nothing technologically stopping it from being able to be done right now, mm -hmm. um, as a small development team from a small startup, like we're still relying on a lot of other tools that are out there. And some yeah. of those tools are just, I mean, JavaScript is an amazing, amazing tool for you to be able to develop things quickly, but performance is not going, I'm not going to be able to write a uh, Grand Theft Auto or I don't know what <laughs> Call of yeah. Duty or something like that in such a way sure. that it's real time. And then there is other complexities with real time gaming of you need to sync, mm -hmm. you need to have a, a, some sort of synchronizing clock that if you're, if we're in a first person shooter and I shoot at you and you move, well, your system might think that I missed you and mine might think that I hit you. And unless sure. they get feedback of exactly what happened, um, mm -hmm. There, there needs to be agreement on what actually happened. And there's all sorts of technology that does that and is used in those worlds, but that would need to get kind of pulled back into the Bitcoin space more of like, sure. okay, well, those are actually getting signed and, and how quickly can we validate those signatures and how quickly can we make mm -hmm. the signatures? Um, so the, the pieces are all there. It's just mm -hmm. a matter of someone, and I, I think that's probably where Dean's comment or you that you mentioned earlier of maybe getting some yeah, GPUs the on the GPU, pipeline yeah. and like right. there's absolutely possibilities that people could build customized hardware, mm. customize everything that makes this scream. Um, right. And if it ties in with with something like a how where they're going with the node software in Terranode, that maybe there's a transaction validation unit that I can just hit there that super quick, sure. and I don't care about the rest of. Like as soon as I've done the validation, I can move on with my logic and everything else I need to do, and they can just take care of, of getting it on chain for me. Um, yeah, makes sense. Yeah. So how many how many transactions would a typical fight be? Is it something like five or ten or? Um, it really depends on how, well, anywhere from as few as five, but that really means you got in it, someone got a critical hit right from the get go, and the other person died. Mm -hmm. to I mean, right now how the things play out i don't think i've ever seen one more than like 40 or 50 but that's right. really like um people are really strong and the dice rolls are just count up that no one's hitting each other uh we do have okay. a fatigue mechanic built in actually that's even probably high um it's probably more like 25 or 30. we have a fatigue okay. mechanism built in right now such that after i think seven or eight rounds um, each player starts taking damage regardless of whether they got hit or not. Um, oh, okay. So Makes that sense. that just ensures... So one of the things of how we do like random, random number generation is we actually pick a random number at the very beginning of the battle and then we hash it and then hash the hash of that and hash the hash. So we, we build out this big long hash chain that just kind of we use to kind of prove throughout the battle that we're not picking random numbers um, that could skew the output because we've already established the whole chain of random numbers at the very beginning of the battle. Mm -hmm. Well, that chain needs to be longer or at least as long as however many turns the battle is. So yep. if we don't have ways of making sure the battle closes or shuts down within 50 rounds, well, then we need to make sure there's more than 50 elements of our hash chain. Sure. So there is certain things we need to build around there just to make sure that we're prepared. Cause if we get to a point that it's, I mean, if we generate 128 uh, long hash chain, which I think is what we do right now, and we get to round 127 and there's not another random number to go. Well, that, that battle is stuck. I mean, we can't move it forward okay. because I cannot provide an input that's going to validate that's going to go to the next state. So yeah, it's done. Mm -hmm. So uh, real, real quick, there's people saying uh, per usual that uh, the paper wallets that we've shown are fake. So if you have <laughs> successfully swept one of the wallets that was kindly given by Zatoshi uh, sponsored by freebsv.com. Uh, if you are a winner of one of the swept wallets, if you could comment so kindly and, and let uh, let people know that you did indeed receive the BSV that was given there, uh, it would be much appreciated as, um, yeah, it's just kind of, you know, don't, don't appreciate the negativity, but also you can always look on chain to, uh, <laughs> to see when, when it was swept and how much was in there and all that uh, information too. Got the... Uh, Oh, uh, Alex Moon saying we will show them all again at the end. Uh, so we got some bunch of interesting stuff here. Uh, we got Morning Worm saying, why wouldn't you record the final outcome of the game instead of every move in real time? Is there a reason why you would not just do a delay and then upload a one transaction at the end? Um, I mean, we certainly could do that. But part of that, so um, actually, I see uh, 
Becky mentioning the uh, the unicorn deal right now, and that's a very yeah. great example of it. So we just made a deal with this company called Unicorn that does um, essentially different types of exotic bets. Um, and so that's one example where they're actually going to be, um, we're going to be providing content for them to take bets against. And so mm. if they want to do an exotic bet where someone says, all right, I think there will be a critical hit within the next or within the first two turns of a battle, they're actually going to have the direct feed of the game data to be able to, um, to be able to service those bets and to know what happened. Um, and there are certainly game modes where we could record it um, and, and put it all on chain at the end. And, and the Bitcoin sure. transactions work such a way that we don't actually, I mean, if we have validated it internally and we know that it's valid and um, I mean, it, it increases double spend risk, but there's that. But at the same time, there really isn't a whole lot of reason to hold on to them. Um, sure. Like how, how the BSV network works, like there really isn't a, okay, I've got a hundred transactions or a hundred thousand transactions. I mean, I could rank, I could make a deal with a miner that says, okay, here's today's transactions. I'll give you a hundred bucks for you to put it in the next block that you make. And mm -hmm. it doesn't deal with anything with transaction fees or all. And there might be models in the future where that makes sense. But right now yeah. it's really cheap to broadcast transactions and with deals with miners with hash power, we can make it even more cheap. And um, sure. so I, I think it, it almost, the value of the network is there and the chain is there. And then as far as like the outcome of like, if I were just to re uh, record the outcome of the battle and not what happened during the battle, well, what we actually get with how these run jigs work is the actual events that happen on chain are what changes the state of the token. So your property is actually growing and changing based on its own definition and how you've interacted with it. And yep. so it isn't it isn't just like, oh, you're just taking my word that I say, okay, these people provided this and and here's proof of the outcome. It literally is. You can go look and you don't need to rely on my infrastructure at all. You can scrub the chain. You can be right. subscribed to all updates that are of crypto fights and you can rebuild this whole state and you can run take bets on that state. Uh, you can do any of that. And I, I can't stop you. It's, it's public right. data on a public blockchain. Um, well, actually... That gives some interesting uh, opportunities to aggregate a ton of data uh, to help with betting too. So, you, you know, you can say like, well, this type of player with this type of weapon has, you know, whatever their edge is versus some other thing. So well, not uh, even that. I think it's really study yeah, being able to have the community both study play styles and figure out mm. as trends grow and change in different types of games. Um, mm. Like we were talking to uh, this mathematician guy who, I think he did a little work for us a year and a half or so ago um, where he was actually an esports coach and his job was to study how people play this game to figure how best to counter it. And all the data is there for that. And then as people start studying those and as gameplay approaches start changing, well, obviously then how you counter those starts changing. And so it's just, it ends up yeah. making just this whole world of everything is there. Everything is connected to everything else. You can see how it all works. Um, and it's kind of a just provides a lot of neat tools for people to play with. Yeah, it sure does. It's fascinating. Uh, is there anything else we should cover? I, you know, I don't want these to go for, you know, absolutely ever. Uh, I mean, I could talk about this all day. I find it <laughs> like super fascinating, but here's another question from uh, Bitcoin Becky Legero saying this deal with unicorn is huge for the esports betting space. I interviewed Adam Kling on this subject of providing data for betting operators a few years back. And you guys have done it. Bravo from Bitcoin Becky. Yeah, we're really excited about that because in a lot of ways, we feel like this is kind of helping to set the template for how other games can do this the same exact thing. Um, and, and especially if we provide most all of the tooling for... Uh, so like when a user... Let me actually... Um, well, I won't, I won't show that. But within our game, within our whole... There is no concept that a user ever has to see that says, I have a crypto wallet. There isn't anything where they now certainly for fallback of um, well I won't even go to that right now you log <laughs> in with a username and a password it, it's very similar to how Money Button does their logins yep. of username password some hashing some some password key derivation functions some encryption and your keys are all in your wallet 
in your browser, in your whatever, and they're not they're not anything we ever have. They're not anything you ever have to know that you're interacting with. Yep. Um, and we've got mechanisms for password resets and for recovering if you lose it and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it's so from a user standpoint, it's just a game. It's I'm, I'm logging into a game. I, I need to sign up an account like I like I do with many other games. Um, yep. And that's it. Um, but then what it brings is all these interesting mechanisms for for essentially video game monetization that didn't exist before. Right. So sure. if we as a game developer don't need to make, um, we don't need to put ads in our thing or we don't need to have you buy some extra token ju- jewels to whatever. Um, right. <laughs> but if, if we make money by you playing and the transaction fees for a battle cost us a half a penny or a third of a penny and we can monetize above that level and maybe our infrastructure costs us that same amount um like the cost ends up being it ends up giving us a way that we don't really and and i'm not saying crypto because crypto fights we are doing our own um i mean it is skill-based bets that are going on on so you're going to put a dollar in and you can win a dollar 80 or again those numbers are probably not finalized but yeah um so we're going that route, but just having all the tools in place that that other games can build and can monetize, and especially in this world where we start getting more um, cooperative, that says, okay, your game can use stuff from my game, and my game can use stuff from from your game. Well, if there's mechanisms in there that we can make money without having to lock you into our ecosystems, that's how we do get to Ready Player One. That's how we get to the point sure. where it's a big virtual world and your stuff plays with my stuff plays with everything else. And as long as we're to the same standards of how things work, it works. For sure. Got a question from Diddy here saying, I'd really like to know what the intention is in regard to the founders tokens. Are they going to mint do, or are you going to mint new tokens uh, for current owners or migrate from engine? Uh, I thought I remember this being discussed uh, a number of months ago. What's so, the status on that? So the status of all the engine tokens is we have the full mechanism played out for how those are going to get converted. And it's essentially going to be all of the engine tokens that you own. Um, we are going to create an Ethereum address for every user on our account, on our system. You will send us a any amount of Ethereum. The smallest amount you can is totally fine, just to prove that you own that account. And then at that point, you so engine tokens have this melt functionality that you can essentially... So they've got some of that engine token built in them, and you can melt those down for the engine token that's in it. So once you've registered that account, you can just melt your tokens, and we can query Ethereum to know what tokens were melted by the users that were registered with our system. So essentially, it's just a way that we can, and then we will reissue those on Bitcoin SV. So if you own any of our items on Ethereum engine, um, as soon as we get the main net up, and we can create mainnet. Um, and we, we have mainnet identities to tie your to tie an Ethereum as, address to. Um, then that so that's soon. <laughs> Makes perfect sense to me. Uh, then we have uh, DAP Institute saying, "Have you had any unconfirmed transaction problems? I, I, I imagine you probably did until the ancestor limit uh, made it mainnet recently." <laughs> um, yeah. So. That that has definitely been something. I mean, we've been we've been developing a lot of this last year on a private on a private chain, just because. Um, and th- actually, that ancestor limit was the biggest thing that yeah. that I think has delayed us to this point um, mm-hmm. of what I had to come up with last year because of the ancestor limit on on BSV is a very complex payment channel solution that had sure. lots of things that blew up. Um, and they blew up <laughs> far too frequently. And I mean, and there's things like Run wasn't. I mean, it, it all works, but Run wasn't really developed to to work with those kind of things. And mm-hmm. so there was a lot of just just ripping hair out, rebuilding things, rebuilding things, trying new things. Um, and then, I mean, as soon as they announced that ancestor limit, um, I I just scrapped all that. And so yeah. that's been that's been this calendar year has just been kind of going back to simplicity and going back to basics. And that, that awesome. unlocks so much um, that the new release of the BSV node software is only about a month old. And, mm. um, and I think it was a little bit of a slow rollout and because we're mostly, we're mostly on test net right now. So I don't know that I can actually fully say that all those issues are resolved. 
Um, mm. I know that um, we've been working with Tal to try and get it resolved such that on testnet, I'll have that same functionality. But right now, I do still occasionally hit some too long mempool chain errors. and um, Sure. And, but that's, again, we're in testnet, we're in development tools. Um, yep. And we have, I have, I have assurance that actually last night, I was trying to get it set up this morning such that I knew that this would all be working today, but I mm -hmm. got a little busy for that. So this sure. evening I am going to be plugging into Tal and making sure that that's all resolved. So nice. I don't, I, I think that'll be no longer an issue. Very cool. It actually makes a compelling uh, first person case for uh, why protocol set in stone, but also uh, why having things wide open and set in stone is, is crucial so that you don't have to do exactly that, like tool and then retool and then retool. I can't imagine, you know, building this on Bitcoin cash or something, for example, that like, you know, there is a hard fork coming up. You don't know what the change is even going to be, but sometime in the next year, you're going to have to retool uh, major things <laughs> for well, and, your business. And actually, I think we even had kind of the opposite of that in that, mm -hmm. Like, although I think it didn't happen as soon as anyone wanted it to, this ancestor, this ancestor limit, everyone knew that this was the biggest, the biggest uh, roadblock to yeah. continuing to scale. And the node developers were working on it. Chief Steve yeah. Chatters was absolutely aware of exactly that everyone needed this, um, and um, and that. Uh, yeah, it's like, so it wasn't like, I don't know what this is going to turn into. It's more like, I need a stopgap until this becomes what I know it's going to become. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yeah. <laughs> Chatting yourself, yeah. Kurt. Yeah, you, you know what? I, I try to be omnipresent uh, at all times, and sometimes it's, <laughs> it's, it's easier than others. Uh, the official coin geek, make sure to follow Crypto Fights on all social channels. David Case and Adam Kling as well and uh, <laughs> big things coming soon. Uh, David, thank you so much for your time. Um, is there anybody does, who deserves a shout out? Do you want to, you know, hi, hi mom, hi kids. Thanks for, um, you know, I mean, leaving I guess me alone for two years. <laughs> certainly my, my business partners of Adam and Abel who Abel doesn't get nearly the limelight that Adam and I do. But he's been on this as long as I have, actually a little longer than I have. He is the game master. He's involved in all the Unity development, um, mm. all that prettiness and pulling it all together. Um, and yeah, so those guys, um, obviously I'm the let's let's make this cool blockchain-y stuff where they're <laughs> like, let's make a game and let's make a business. Um, yeah. And betwixt us both, uh, it's, been, it's been a long, slow road, but I feel like we're, I feel like we're getting there and really excited for the next few weeks or hopefully not too many months, but yeah, absolutely. So first of all, good use of betwixt Uh big fan of anytime that comes up. Uh, <laughs> and also thank you for your friendship, man. I, I, I just, I, I appreciate uh, you and I'm looking forward to having a beer and a sandwich or yeah, two okay. or three uh, as soon as we can. <laughs> I will definitely make the drive over. So absolutely. So thank you, David. Uh, we'll let you go and say some closing words and, uh, you know, kick off the rest of the day here. So All right. thanks, thanks again. For it. Yep. Take care. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, uh, David Case from Crypto Fights. Uh, and, and I mean it. He's, he's an actual friend. Uh, we met at the Chicago BSV meetup uh, about two years ago now. And he, he walked in and shook my hand and said, hey, I'm been developing this game on ethereum and you know it just doesn't work and i've i've recently come to understand you know some of what's possible on bitcoin sv and we had a really good conversation i ended up probably talking to him for two hours and ignoring a lot of the other people at the meetup uh because i was so intrigued by this and uh i've been telling people um i actually interviewed david probably a year and a half ago when i was working at uh, a completely different uh organization and um had a really good interview then but i i really truly think that crypto fights is going to uh, be a massive proof of concept. I think people are going to look at it and say, oh man, we have been very sorely underestimating the power of uh, Bitcoin SV. Uh, but, and the, you know, the UTXO model of Bitcoin and all of that fundamentally. And I just think that um, he's one of those guys that's been quietly doing proof of work and doing what I keep telling you, the viewer, to do. Uh, you're powerful. You you have the ability to build wonderful things. And, and it doesn't have to be software. If you're good at facilitating relationships or if you're good at doing accounting or sales or, or business development or marketing, or maybe you're a graphic designer, or maybe you're all, all these other things that businesses need, 
you should start organizing with people to build really cool things on chain because Bitcoin has this ability to connect the world in a way which no other thing does. This is like we're sitting in the late 1980s or the early 1990s and looking at the internet and saying, oh my gosh, how can we build a business and, and connect to the people that are flocking to this new, an incredible, world-changing, life-changing technology and, and how can we sell things to people? How can we be first to put together market share to use this incredible tool the best? Uh, because blockchains have existed now for about 12 years. Uh, they've been doing what they do, but they haven't been doing it very well. And, and the real power has been locked up for a very long time. Uh, I, I talk quite a bit about the Bitcoin civil war and all these different things. And, and really, my, my goal is for those things to become a very small parenthetical note in the history of Bitcoin. And uh, just about a year, a little more than a year ago, we had the Genesis protocol upgrade. And just about a month ago, we, we eliminated the ancestor limit entirely. And, and those two things really create a, a brave new world that has, has been very, very minimally explored. But I know people like David and, and, and there's a few other people out there that, that really get it. And they've really been burning the candle at both ends to create a world that we're not even going to believe. People keep mentioning Ready Player One uh, in the troll box here. And that's really what the world can look like. We just have to be brave enough to get out there, work really, really hard. Uh, you know, Don't expect to just buy, hodl, sit back. Everyone hates us anyways. And they're going to hate us even more uh, when we start actually melting faces with stuff really cool like crypto fights. So the hodl mentality, uh, you know, we, we've said hodl, hodl's no good. And if you're a BSV holder, instead of, uh, <laughs> instead of many other things, it, you're, you're probably feeling that heat. But truly, get out there build something of value, we are going to earn every percentage gain and value that we ever get. It's going to be bought and <laughs> through sweat equity, quite frankly. But I believe in you, and I'm very excited to be part of this revolution with you, the viewer of the CoinGeek live stream starring Kurt Walker Jr. And uh, please tell your friends, please like, subscribe. Again, like, like this video right now. If you're sitting here staring at it, like the video. But subscribe, share it to your friends, and let them know that every Tuesday afternoon at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, I am here to answer your questions, comments, blessings, cursings, grapes, gripes, or gropes, because I love you. And I will see you next week. Ladies and gentlemen, left-handed salute. Goodbye. This is buybsv.com, the quick and simple way to buy Bitcoin SV. You can't miss it. It says a quick and simple way to buy BSV on buybsv.com. It's safe and secure. Within an hour, you'll own BSV digital assets, which means it's so quick and simple. So if you want to buy BSV, use buybsv.com. It does exactly what it says. <laughs>